Usually when I animate a sprite sheet, I like to put each animation move on a separate row, like this. It's easier to see where each character move starts and where it ends, and the animation code is simpler to understand for complete beginners, but it also creates some unused empty space here. You might get a sprite sheet where frames are organized more efficiently. Sometimes we call this a compact sprite sheet. When we reorganize the frames to get rid of any unused space, I get my grow animation here, float animation in these frames, wing animation is here, and height animation is in this area. Let me show you how to control character animation with a sprite sheet like this, and let's create fun little project with animated forest creature while learning about JavaScript and HTML Canvas game development and image manipulation. Feel free to use this sprite sheet in your own projects, there is no copyright. Now let's jump into the code and bring our character to life. Have fun! We have a basic web page markup with some title. We linked CSS style sheet, created HTML5 canvas element, and we linked script.js file. In style CSS I do global reset, so margin zero, padding zero, and box size in border box. Canvas will have a blue background so that I can see it when I'm positioning it. I go back to index.html and I bring our sprite sheet into the project as an image element. ID will be mandrake and source is mandrake.png. You can download this free art asset in the video description. I create a div with an ID of container and I put canvas inside. Inside I also create another div with an ID of controls. Paragraph that says play animation like this. First I hide the mandrake image by giving it display none. I want to have some input elements, probably radio buttons. When you click them it will play different animations from the sprite sheet. When used in an actual game we would replace these click events with some in-game events. For example we would play the screaming animation when the player gets too close. I give all the radio buttons the same name, for example animation. This will make sure they are all in the same group, meaning that only one of these radio buttons can be selected at the time. Only one animation can be played at one time. The first one will play all of them. When this radio button is checked, it will play all the animations in a loop. The entire sprite sheet, from start to finish, over and over. I give it checked attribute to make sure this one is selected by default on the first page load. I also create a label for all and it will say all like this. Keep in mind that we associate labels with their input elements using this special for attribute and we point towards ID. When label and input element are paired like this, radio button can be selected by clicking on the radio button itself but also by clicking on the label. Useful. The second radio will be the same, again it will have name animation. As I said I will do that to make sure all these radio buttons are a part of the same input group. We use it to make sure all these radio buttons see each other, so that only one of them can be selected at a time. The second input we will have is grow and when we click it, it will play only a part of the sprite sheet. This part with grow animation frames. Label for grow will say grow, like this. We will also create input radio button for wing animation, float animation and height animation like this. So our goal now is to animate the sprite sheet on the blue canvas element and swap between different animations as we click different radio buttons. Let's bring our mandrake root to life with JavaScript. I put canvas here. I want to use a better font. I go to Google Fonts website and I search for bangers. You can use a different font if you want. When you find your font, you click this plus button, adding the style to your fonts library. Then we click up here to view the auto-generated code. It generated some link tags for us, so I copy them and I pass them up here in index.html. 
make sure you place them before the link to style CSS file to make sure the font is available there. Now to actually use the font all I have to do is copy this CSS rule and apply it here. It's easy to use custom web fonts like this. Let's give container some box shadow. Maybe 5 pixels horizontal, 5 pixels vertical, 5 pixels blur and black color. I center the container in the middle of the page by giving it position absolute, top 50%, left 50%, and transform translate minus 50% minus 50%. Let's also give it a small border, 1 pixel solid black. It needs padding, 10 pixels maybe. I copy the box shadow and apply it also to canvas element, replacing the blue background. Maybe we can try inset shadow to see what it looks like. It makes it a bit 3D. I want the container to be 500 pixels wide. I give controls font size of 40 pixels, margin 10 pixels, paragraph inside controls, so this line that says player animation will have font size 60 pixels. Let's try to give it a display flex. Hmm. Flex direction column. That got us to the same place we were before. Justify content center maybe. No, it doesn't do much here. Let's get back to this later. We are about to draw image with the JavaScript. I only want the JavaScript code to run when the full page, including the image element, has been fully loaded. So event listener for load event. And I put all my code into this anonymous callback function. I set up my canvas as usual. Custom variable I call canvas is document dot get element by ID canvas one. CTX context is canvas dot get context 2D. We are exploring the world of 2D web animation today. I set width property of canvas element to 500 pixels and height to 500 pixels as well. To check if everything is set up and ready, I can console lock my context variable from line 3. This variable contains an instance of built-in canvas rendering context 2D API. It's an object that holds all the properties and methods we will use to draw. Focus of this class will be mainly on draw image method that sits right here. I want to have each radio button on a separate line. Let's just cheat a little bit and use single line break tags here. I want to focus on JavaScript animation, not on CSS layouts today. This will work well for our needs. We can create our mandrake root as an object or I will define it as a class, a blueprint to create many similar objects. I assume that this is an enemy creature in our game so you might want to create more than one at a time. It doesn't really matter if you do class syntax or object syntax here in the case of our project today. Our class will need to have a constructor, draw method to draw currently active animation frame on canvas and update method to cycle between animation frames, swap animations and so on. We will need this.image property storing a reference to the entire sprite sheet image. I use get element by ID and here on line 14 I can see that I gave it an ID of mandrake so I use that here. Sprite width will be the width of a single frame. In our case 256 pixels. Height of a single frame is also 256 pixels. For a game I would make it smaller but for this project I want large clean images. I will also define width property and in this case it will be the same as sprite width, so 256 pixels. I prefer to have these values separate even though in this case they have identical values because it can be used for scaling the images and to better illustrate how draw image method cuts out individual frames when animating the sprite sheet. We will cover that later in the video. X and Y coordinates will be zero, so top left corner of canvas. Today we will also learn how to center the image in the middle of canvas and how to make sure it always stays centered even when we scale the image up and down. 
min frame will be 0 and max frame will be 355. This is a big sprite sheet with a lot of animation frames. I wanted to have smooth animation for this class. If you want to use this for your own project and need the sprite sheet with lower frame rate or you need just separate animations, let me know. I can easily convert it for you and give you what you need. I will probably leave a zip file in the description with multiple versions of this sprite sheet so you can play with it and use it in your games. Draw method will expect context as an argument. I use that context and I call built-in draw image method from it. Draw image method needs at least three arguments. Image we want to draw and X and Y coordinates where to draw it on canvas. In this case it will draw the entire image, the whole sprite sheet, with 355 frames at its original size. Let's draw it first before we animate anything so that we can see how the changes we are making to the code affect the image we are drawing. I create an instance of my custom mandrake class from line 8 by using the new keyword and calling the class name like this. This will trigger class constructor on line 9 and it will create one new instance of our mandrake class for us. It will create one mandrake object with these properties and with an access to draw and update methods. I console log it to make sure everything works well so far. In console I can see that we have our mandrake object. The properties on that object are organized alphabetically here, so not in the same order as we define them here. But this order here inside the constructor still matters, because width can only be defined after we defined sprite width in this case. Width needs to come after sprite width here as JavaScript reads this code line by line from top to bottom. I can see that we have our image here and I check if none of the properties on mandrake object are undefined, which would signal some problem inside the constructor. All is good. We can close the console and delete the console log. So we have a mandrake class. We have a mandrake variable that holds an object created using that class. Now let's create animation loop from where we will draw it. I create a custom function I call animate. I take our mandrake object from line 28 and I call its associated draw method from line 20. Now I call animate to actually run the code. I can see that the draw method expects context as an argument, so I pass it ctx from line 3. That ctx will be passed here, given a variable name context, and from that we will call draw method on line 21. And we are drawing the sprite sheet. As I said, we are passing draw image three arguments, image to draw and where to draw it. Each frame is 256 times 256 pixels and entire canvas is 500 times 500 pixels. So we are drawing just a small portion of the sprite sheet. Draw image method can also take optional fourth and fifth arguments for width and height. This is used for scaling. It will fit the entire image into the area we define. So if I pass it canvas width from line 4 as width and canvas height from line 5 as height, we will scale and squeeze the entire sprite sheet into the area of 500 times 500 pixels. We can use these two additional arguments for width and height to scale the image up and down or we can stretch it by giving it a different ratio between width and height. Right now I'm pulling variables from the outside directly into my class. That's a bad practice, so let's not do that. What if I pass it width from line 12 and height as well from here? We will squeeze the entire sprite sheet to an area of one frame. One frame in this sprite sheet is 256 times 256 pixels. So finally, there is a third version of draw image method that accepts nine arguments. Image we want to draw, source x, source y, source width and source height to specify a rectangular area we want to crop out from the source image, in our case a single frame in the sprite sheet, and destination x, destination y, destination width and destination height to define where to place that cropped out piece of image on destination canvas. Let's say I want to crop out just the top left frame, so the area from coordinate 0, 0 and size of that cropped area will be sprite width from line 10 and sprite height from line 11, so 256 times 256 pixels. Nice, we are cropping out the first frame and drawing it on canvas. Unfortunately this frame doesn't have much happening on it, so we can barely see anything. If I change source x to 256, we are drawing this frame. If I change source y to 256, we will draw this frame. 
512 as source Y will draw this frame. I hope you can see how we can navigate around the sprite sheet now by just changing the values we pass as source X and source Y here to draw image method. Every time we jump by sprite width or sprite height, we are moving to a different frame somewhere in the sprite sheet. Instead of hard coding these coordinates, we can dynamically calculate them. I can calculate horizontal source X coordinate by using sprite width from line 10. Vertical source Y argument will be sprite height from line 11. So 0 times sprite width and 0 times sprite height will give us top left frame. I can now navigate around the sprite sheet just by changing the values I'm multiplying by. This value determines which column we are on, starting from 0 and increasing as we move right. This value is row starting from 0 at the top and going down. So 2-2 two, two is this frame, 4-2 is this frame, 6-2 is this frame. 6-8 is this frame. Before we automate cycling through the frames using the infrastructure we just created, let's center the image in the middle of canvas. Drawing images on canvas has the same rules as drawing rectangles. The starting coordinates we give it determines the top left corner of the image and the image goes from there to the right and down, depending on its width and height. So if I use 20 pixels as X, I'm pushing the image 20 pixels to the right. If I use 50 pixels as starting Y coordinate, I'm pushing the image 50 pixels down. So what if I want the image to be exactly in the middle of the page, in the middle of canvas element? I can pass it canvas width divided by 2 as horizontal X coordinate and canvas height divided by 2 as the vertical Y coordinate. This will move the top left corner of the image exactly in the middle of the page. The problem is that the image is not really centered now. Also, we are doing a bad practice right now and we are pulling canvas width from line 4 and canvas height from line 5 directly inside our class. Let's instead pass them as arguments properly and convert them into class properties. I make sure that the constructor expects width and height of available canvas area as arguments. Then I convert these arguments into class properties. So canvas width property on this mandrake object is canvas width variable that was passed as an argument to the constructor. Same for canvas height. Now that we know that constructor expects canvas width and canvas height here on line 8, down here on line 29, where we create an instance of this class, I pass it canvas width from line 4 and canvas height from line 5. This is how you do it correctly and how you make your classes independent of their current lexical scope and how you make them reusable. If you are a beginner, passing variables around might seem unnecessarily complicated, but believe me, it makes sense to do things this way when you are creating bigger projects. Keeping your code modular and more independent from its surroundings becomes a necessity, so it's a good idea to get into a habit of doing that when we are practicing on smaller projects like this today. We pass canvas width and canvas height to Mandrake class constructor. These values get passed here. They get converted into class properties and we can use them here to find the center of canvas area. Nice, we refactored our code with some good practices and we can finally center our Mandrake creature in the middle. If I want it to be in the middle of the screen horizontally, I need to offset it by its width from line 14. It's important to offset by width and not by sprite width from line 12, because this way it will stay centered even when we scale it up or down. So to center image horizontally, we put it in the middle of canvas area and offset it back by a half of its own width. Now it's centered. We can do the same thing vertically, like this. Perfect. To show you that it will stay centered even when we scale it, let's define a property called for example this.scale and initially I set it to 2. 
Hmm, now I'm realizing there are multiple ways to do this. I can either use scale when I'm calculating size directly on line 14 and 15, assuming I define scale first. Or alternatively, I can multiply with times scale on line 23. And I make sure I account for that value when centering on line 17. I do the same for vertical Y position. We have most of the logic in place already. Well done if you are a beginner and you managed to follow this far. Click the like to let me know you like this type of content. We can travel around the sprite sheet horizontally and vertically by changing these multipliers. On line 23. And we can also scale the image up and down on line 16. And the image will always stay centered in the middle. This is a solid setup for a sprite animation code base. We can do so many things with this now. Instead of hard coding these values to navigate around the sprite sheet, we can put them into variables, class properties. I will call this one frame X. Initially I set it to 10. And I replace it here inside the draw image method. For vertical navigation, for jumping between rows in the sprite sheet, we will have a variable called frame Y. Initially I set it to for example 9 and I replace the hardcoded value inside the draw image method with it as well. Now we can swap horizontal frames using frame X and vertical frames using frame Y. Perfect. Now let's cover the most important part. We need to cycle through these frames in a specific way to actually play the animation and bring our mandrake root creature to life. Let's start very simple and first we will just animate the top row. Each row in this particular sprite sheet has 18 horizontal frames. I will say if frame x from line 21 is less than 18, increase frame x by 1. Else set frame x back to 0, so that it can cycle through that animation row of frames again. To actually run this animation I need to call the update method from line 27 down here on line 37. Alright, we have a function called animate, but it doesn't really animate yet. It just runs once and draws our image. To create animation loop I will use request animation frame built-in method. This method will simply call a function we pass to it as an argument. I will pass it animate, the name of its parent function, to create an endless animation loop. And we are animating 18 frames on this row. Because frame Y is set to 10 and we count rows from 0. We are getting this weird blurry effect around our animated character. It is because we can see old paint on canvas. We can see old animation frames. I want to completely delete everything on canvas between every animation frame. So I call built-in clear rectangle method and I want to clear the entire canvas so coordinates 0 0 and width and height of the area will be canvas width and canvas height. We have some blinking, it means I'm going too far along the row and I'm including one or more empty frames. Let's try to fix it by reducing this number. That worked, no more blinking. So we have a very basic animation infrastructure. I can swap the row we are animating by swapping value here in frame Y. Now I'm animating this row. Now I'm animating this row. I can travel row by row all the way down. Now I would like to play frames in the entire sprite sheet, which means we will have to go row by row from top to bottom like this. To do that I will need a helper variable. Class property I will call for example frame. It will cycle between min frame of 0 from line 19 and max frame of 355 from line 20. Let's start by defining this dot frame and setting it to 0 at first. This code can only cycle over a single row. We will have to come up with something different, so let's comment this out. I say if this dot frame from line 21 is less than this dot max frame from line 20, increase this dot frame by 1. Else set this dot frame back to min frame of 0 from line 19, so it can cycle again. So these two lines now make sure that this dot frame endlessly cycles between 0 and 355, between min frame and max frame. The problem is that we don't use this dot frame anywhere in our animation code. It doesn't have any effect on which animation frame is currently displayed. For that, we need frame X to map horizontal position and frame Y to map vertical position in the sprite sheet. 
we now need to figure out a way to extract the correct frame x and frame y coordinate from the single this.frame variable value to correctly map the currently active frame to x and y coordinates in the sprite sheet. So again, this.frame is cycling between 0 and 355 and we somehow want to calculate x and y coordinate from that sprite sheet. For example, when this.frame is 20, we want to get frame x 2 and frame y 1, like this. That can be passed to draw image method to crop out the correct current frame. Let's start with the more complicated one, frame x, horizontal frame, that determines which column we are currently on in the sprite sheet will be this.frame remainder 18. The remainder operator returns the remainder left over when the first operand is divided by the second operand. I'm dividing by 18 because each row has 18 horizontal frames. If you are using a different compact sprite sheet, divide by the number of frames you have on a single row. For example, if this dot frame is currently 5, 5 divided by 18 is 0, 0 times 18 is 0, and we need 5 to reach 5. 5 modulo 18 is 5. Frame x will be 5. It might seem a bit complicated if this is the first time you're seeing the remainder operator, but don't worry, it's just about practice. If this dot frame is currently 21, 21 divided by 18 is 1. 1 times 18 is 18, and we need 3 to reach 21. Remainder is 3, frame x will be 3. If frame is 36, 36 divided by 18 is 2. 2 times 18 is 36, and we have a remainder of 0. Frame x will be 0. So we know each row is 18 frames. We just divide the current frame by 18, and horizontal exposition is what remains. To get the right position in the sprite sheet, the right coordinates, we need at the same time use the same this.frame value to extract vertical y coordinate. Get in frame y, the current vertical frame, the current row in the sprite sheet is simple. This.frame y is a this.frame divided by 18 and we wrap it in math.floor to round it down to remove any decimal points because we have rows 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. We don't have a row 1.5 in the sprite sheet. Math.floor returns the largest integer less than or equal to a given number. So if this dot frame is for example 9, 9 divided by 18 is 0 0.5 and math.floor of 0 0.5 is 0. Frame y will be 0. We are on the top row. If frame is currently 26, 26 divided by 18 is 1.4444. Method floor of 1.4444 is 1. We are on the row 1. Frame Y is 1. This one was a bit simpler to calculate. <laughs> so we are using this dot frame variable to cycle between values of 0 and 355, between min frame from line 19 and max frame from line 20. As the value of this dot frame changes, we extract the value of frame x on line 33 and the value of frame y on line 34 to get the correct coordinates, the correct position in the sprite sheet. These frame x and frame y properties are then used as arguments passed the draw image method on line 26 to crop out the currently active animation frame from our sprite sheet. If you are a beginner and you followed this far, well done. This was the challenging part of the tutorial. Now I want to create events that pick specific animation range from our sprite sheet, in our case grow, wing, float and height animation, and we will attach that to click events on radio buttons. But the same thing can be done to attach this to an in-game event. For example, our mandrake root character can float in the air when it's hungry or something. <laughs> Let's delete this code, we don't need it anymore. I will comment out this part. We can also write the same code with a different syntax on one line if you want to impress someone. <laughs> we will use so-called ternary operator. Ternary operator is the only JavaScript operator that takes three operands. In our case, we will use it as a simple one-line if-else statement. We start by a condition, followed by a question mark, then an expression to execute if the condition evaluates the truth, followed by a colon and the expression to execute if the condition evaluates as false. 
Same as we did on lines 29 and 30, I just want this dot frame from line 21 to cycle between this dot min frame and this dot max frame. I do that by saying this dot frame is equal to ternary operator expression. Condition to evaluate will be if this dot frame is less than this dot max frame. If it is, question mark, increase this dot frame by one. If it isn't, colon, set this dot frame back to this dot main frame. Line 31 does the exactly same thing as lines 29 and 30. It's just written in a more compact syntax. So right now we are cycling between min frame of 0 and max frame of 355, which plays all animations. Now I would like to be able to click grow, wing, float and hide and play each of these animations separately. I make sure I stay inside my Mandrake class and down here I create another custom method I call for example set animation. It will expect two arguments. I will call them new min frame and new max frame like this. Inside I set this dot min frame from line 19 to new min frame that will be passed as an argument. I will also take this dot max frame from line 20 and I set it to new max frame. By changing min frame and max frame values here, I can change the animation range and play only that part of animation. I also have to set the current frame to new min frame to make sure the animation starts playing from that point in the sprite sheet. And that's it. Now I can simply use this new public set animation method to set animation range for our character. Here on line 18 we have an input element, a radio button with an ID of all. I bring it into our JavaScript project by creating a constant variable called all. I point it towards the input element with an ID of all, like this. Then I attach an event listener for click event to it. Inside I take the instance of our Mandrake class we created on line 42 and I call its associated set animation method. On line 35 I can see that method expects new min frame and new max frame. When we click all, I want the entire sprite sheet to play, so I pass it min frame of 0 and max frame of 355. The second input element we created has an ID of grow. And when we click it, we set animation frames to cycle between the range of 0 and 75. These animation frames show our mandrake root growing up from the ground. The third radio button has an ID of wing, so again I point JavaScript towards it using get element by ID and I add event listener to it. We listen for click event and in the anonymous callback function we will run set animation method and we pass it min frame of 76 and max frame of 112, this range. We also have float animation block. This one is long, it contains frames with our character floating up in the air, opening mouth and slowly floating back into the ground. The range here will be from minimum frame 113 to maximum frame of 262. The last animation will be hide, where the mandrake root just goes back underground. I think the range is somewhere in between 263 and 355. Ok, time to save changes and check if the click events work. When I click hide we get this animation on repeat, perfect. Grow plays these frames, nice. Wink works. Float works as well. We've built a simple UI and by clicking these radio buttons we play either all the frames or just a specific animation. Instead of attaching these to click events, you can call mandrake.setAnimation from somewhere else in your game code to make the character react to all different kinds of in-game events. At this point you understand how it works, so feel free to use this to implement your own game design ideas. I will show you some of my own implementations in the following video. I'll see you there!